my assignment this morning, I heard the Lord very clearly give me an assignment. He said, your assignment this morning is to preach some joy into people, to preach some joy. How many of y'all could use a little bit of joy? Amen. He says, your assignment. And he's given me this assignment, like I said, for the summer. So it's not just like he, he gave me just a little spot of it. But he said, tell them that their joy might be made full. Now, that's a scripture verse. That's a verse in the Bible. Uh, we need to understand that. We need to learn that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But in John chapter 15, verse 11, these things, Jesus said, have I spoken unto you that my joy, Jesus is saying, my joy. These things, he said, I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be made full. And so we all have a, a measure of joy, but how many, unless the Lord comes, your joy will never, ever be full. That's a powerful verse. I mean, you could live your entire life off of that verse. I do have life verses that God Galatians 2 20 is my life verse I was crucified with Christ nevertheless I live that's a part of my life verse you could make this a life verse and live a lifetime it's worth practicing that one verse but I keep telling you don't get a case of bursitis bursitis is when you memorize verses but you don't know the story so many Americans, man, they can quote that verse. Okay, I quote that verse. And then I say, okay, well, can you tell me the story? The story, what story? The story that that verse is in. Can you tell me the story? No, I can't even tell you the verse before that verse. Or the verse after that verse. But I can quote the, the verse. That's a disease called bursitis. Don't get it. Don't get bursitis. Be able to tell the story. Jesus was a wonderful storyteller. He used a lot of metaphors. He told stories. I want to share a little bit of a story with you. And, and this same verse that I've started off with this morning, it's bordered by. Part of the story is knowing what's ahead of it, knowing what is after it. It's bordered by this. Jesus says, my father loved me. And he says, so I have loved you. Continue now in this love keep my commandments how many of you know jesus said i kept the father's commandments you see there's always borders how many of you realize that love has borders healthy borders you got to understand he said these things i've spoken to you that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full well what's the story of that the story is that god loved jesus and jesus said i've loved you and I've loved you the same way the Father loved me. And because he's loved me, I've kept his commandments. How many of you realize that part of love is keeping order? I mean, it's not love if there's no... I mean, say you're married to your spouse, but, you know, they cheat on you. Now, that's not real love. Because real love has borders, healthy borders. How many of you understand that? You getting that? So he said, this is how we abide in love. This is how we abide in love, by keeping these borders. And so love or joy comes out of love, and, and love has borders. That's verse 11. That's, uh, that's understanding what love is. But then beneath that verse, he says, Now I've given you a commandment, and this is the commandment that I've given you, is as I have loved you, love others. So now we're squeezing in on the whole story. The story of joy. The story of love. The story of how we receive it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I ask you today to help us, Lord, to see your goodness. Help us to see the provision that you have made for our love, the provision you've made for our joy, the provision you've made for our peace, the, the provision of all of these things, Lord, that you provided. Provision means provided by. Lord, you have provided so many wonderful things. Now teach us how to live off of your provision. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, last Sunday I talked about the worst cuss word in all of the Bible. You know, it's the Greek word apistia. Apistia means faith. Apistia, put an A in front, means the opposite of. And, and actually that's a, a noun form, form apistian. And so Jesus gives you something. And then what he gives you, you complain about not having. 
You see, the scripture says in Romans that God has given to every man a measure of faith. And then we struggle for faith when God has given us faith. And we make it so hard. We make church and we make faith so much about work that I'm working for it. Pastor, I'm working for it. Well, let me tell you, quit working. Let faith work for you. I'm working for this faith. You can't earn faith. You can't earn salvation. You can't work for this stuff. Christianity is a relationship, not works. Jesus is a relationship. Please understand that you can relax in the relationship of God. Of course, you've got to trust him. You've got to love him. You've got to understand his love. Joy comes out of love. If you don't have love, you're not going to have joy. You bring this order all together. And so the greatest cuss word in all of the Bible is that Greek word apistia, which means the opposite of belief. I mean, some people say, well, you know, I just don't believe God. Well, God will give you something so you can believe him with. It's called faith. The Bible says for a man not to think more highly of himself than he ought, but to understand that God has given a measure of faith to everyone. You say, I just don't believe. Well, the reason you don't believe is because you're trying to use your own stuff. And your stuff is broken. We're all broken. How many of you realize we came into this world as broken people? So this broken man is going to use his broken stuff. And when it doesn't work, I'm going to complain to an unbroken God. You see how God doesn't like that? When we tell God what we can't do, we're basically telling God what he can't do. How many of y'all know in the Bible it says this little thing like, with God, all things are possible? Do you know there's another verse that says, nothing shall be impossible with God? That means that God can't do nothing. It's impossible for God to do nothing. He's always doing something, whether you see it or not. He's doing things on your behalf, whether you know about it or not. He's hidden things not from you, but he's hidden things for you that you might discover those things, whether you know it or you don't know it. God can't do one thing, nothing. God's never doing nothing. How many of you know love can never do nothing? Because love has the power within it to not only sustain, but I like the, the Greek word dunamis. When, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you get this power in you. And this power is a love power, but it's the ability to reproduce its own self. How many of you understand love grows? How many of you understand, you can say, oh, I love and I love with all of my heart, but then it's weird how later you can say, I think I love even more. How can you love more when you've loved with everything? How can you get this joy? Well, the week before that, I preached on Doubting Thomas, his, his nickname. Jesus had nicknames for nine of his disciples. Didymus was a nickname for Thomas. Didymus means twin. Jesus called Doubting Thomas, as we call him, Doubting Thomas, he called him twin. Why? Because Thomas had so many questions. Remember Thomas is the one who said, I'm not going to believe unless I see. You know, of course, Jesus walked in through the walls and found the disciples all sitting around a table and scared them half to death. I mean, can you imagine a man walking through a, a stone wall and saying, peace, 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 guys, it's me. And then Jesus immediately, what did he do? He showed them his scars. So we all think about Thomas that Thomas wouldn't believe unless he saw the scars none of the disciples believed until they saw the scars including Thomas and when Thomas saw it he made this confession we could call him confessing Thomas he said my Lord my God my Lord my God I preached on doubt and how doubt is ants in the pants of faith how many of y'all know what ants in the pants will do They'll make you dance, right? How many when you were little kids, you say, ants in the pants will make you dance? I don't know if maybe that's just like what we did in Sweeney. <laughs> Y'all didn't do it in Sealy. But ants in the pants. We all have doubt. And so I preached a message on faith. Because you have faith doesn't mean you don't have doubt. Because doubt entered the garden before sin. Doubt is neutral. Doubt is what brings the questions. So doubt asks questions. Disbelief asks no questions. Religion knows all the answers. That's why I'm not very religious, because there's so much I don't know. 
the more I learn of God, the bigger the mystery grows. You'd think the more you learn, you start shrinking that mystery down. No, the more I learn, the bigger the mystery. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's amazing. It's incredible. I'm having so much fun playing in the sand with God because God keeps bringing new things out that I've never seen, that I've never dreamed, that I've never imagined, and I'm doing things I've never done. And I'm saying, God, you're so awesome. You're so big. Your love is amazing. Because God plays. Last week I pre preached on Pentecost Sunday, major Jewish feast. Also happened to be the day and the time of the New Testament church. The birth of the church happened on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks. It was seven weeks after Passover. It, it was celebrated as the Feast of Bread or the Feast of Wheat. Jesus is the bread of life. When Jesus walked through those walls, he breathed on them. He said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Remember John the Baptist, the first time he ever saw Jesus. Never seen him before. He sees Jesus. And what does he say? He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of this world. He's better than me. He's greater than me. He was before me. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John said, I must decrease. He must increase. That day, the, the Holy Spirit came upon people and they began to pray in languages that they didn't know. And people around them heard them, everyone in their own language. And that day, thousands of people gave their hearts to Jesus. That's the birth of the New Testament church. In Luke 17, they asked Jesus about the kingdom, when it was going to come. And Jesus said, well, the kingdom is not low here or low there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What? The kingdom is inside of me? What do you, what? Well, you remember in the Garden of Eden, man was in the kingdom. The kingdom was not in man. The problem with that was the devil got in there. So, so what did God do? Well, he had this whole plan the whole time. This isn't something he made up on the fly. He said, I put man in the garden. He said, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the garden and I'm going to put it inside the man. That word for low here, low there, the, the, the kingdom doesn't come with, with observations, King James Version word. The, the Greek word there means to be looking as an enemy. To be looking as an enemy. How many of you know you don't play with your enemies? Ah, the kingdom comes within. He put it in you. You know what God's trying to do? He's trying to make it easy. He's not trying to make it hard. The garden was where the glory of God was. In the New Testament, God took that glory and put it inside the man. Holy Spirit lives within us. We become a temple of the Holy Spirit. God moved inside of us. How many of you realize you don't have to go looking for him when he lives inside of you? You don't have to have his address when he lives inside of you. How easy is that? How easy is that? My goodness. God's making this thing so easy. You see, we received grace and faith to be saved. We didn't have grace. We didn't have faith. So God gave us grace and he gave us faith. And he said, you're not saved by works. How many of y'all are still trying to work your Christianity? You're still trying to work to prove something. Quit. Stop. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult. In the garden, God did not live inside of Adam and Eve. He visited and he walked with them every day. And the Bible says in the cool of the day, he walked. In other words, it was not work. He walked with them. He's come to get in the sandbox with us today. He's come to play with us. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you comfortless. How many of you remember when he was raised from the dead and Mary saw him in the garden tomb? Just outside she saw him, but she didn't know who he was. And when he spoke, she didn't totally get, but she finally, bam, it dawned on her. Oh my goodness, this is Jesus. And what did she do? She ran over there to grab him. How many of you say it makes perfect sense? She ran over to grab But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, don't grab me. Don't hold me. He said, let me go. 
How many of you, you, you realize we have the greatest tendency to try to hold on to our past? You know, I'd be like, are you crazy? I ain't never like, you died. I didn't think I was going to see you. Miracle, you walking outside. Rabbi, God, Master, Lord, I'm never letting go of you. Jesus said, it's good for you that I go. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. How easy is that? He said, I'm going to come and live in you. Let me go. What is, what is Jesus doing today? Well, the Bible says he's at the right-hand side of the Father making intercession for the saints. In other words, he's praying for you today. He's praying. He said, man, I tell you what, I've given Pastor Rusty a word. I pray that today you would all receive this word, that you would live off of this word. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Don't cling to the past. Something new is happening. It's so easy. And so they used to go to the temple where God was in a box. That's where we get that phrase, putting God in a box. It was the ark. He dwelt between the cherubim. They could only go in once a time, one time a year for the remission of their sins. And now Jesus is no longer in a box. He's in the hearts of each and every one of us. How easy is that? You want, you want me to tell you how hard it was to get a calf or to get a, a ram or a, and kill it and offer? That's hard. Because you had to bring it to where he was. You had to know the address. Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to make my address in each and every one of you. That's literally what Christian means. It means little Christ. God is in me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Romans 8, 26 says, when you don't know how to pray as you ought, the Holy Spirit itself will pray through you with groanings that cannot be uttered. I mean, he says, how hard is this? He said, I'm going to give you a prayer language and a way to pray that even when you don't know how to pray, Holy Spirit, where is he? He's in us. He's going to pray through you. He's going to pray out of you. How easy is that? And then we get to my two scriptures. Wednesday, I, I spoke about Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 10. It says, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. I, I preached on that. You know, Israel was in a terrible position at this time. Israel is back in the city of Jerusalem, but the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed. The walls are totally torn down. They're black with soot. Uh, they're under Persian control. When you look over there at that little scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Israel was in slavery then as well. This time they're in slavery to the Persians. The place, Jerusalem, they're living like savages inside a city that used to be great, but now it's broken down. How many of you understand this? Let me tell you something that God can do in your life. He can build back the walls of your security. He can build back the great city that you thought was in ruins. And man, I could go forever on Nehemiah. I don't have time. I got to get down to the fact and the point that Ezra was sent by Artaxerxes 14 years earlier than Nehemiah. I don't want to bore you, but I want to just throw this out here. Nehemiah came 14 years later. Artaxerxes sent Ezra. Ezra was a priest. He was a rabbi. You say, well, what did Ezra do? He went and by the eastern gate near the, the water gate, he read the word of God. What was the word of God? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He read it daily. The children of Israel began to come, and then they find themselves where there's between 30 to 50,000 of these people. Now, for years, Ezra's been doing this, and they started believing, and guess what? When Ezra finished reading, they shouted out, Amen! And they all dropped to their knees. Now, you've got to remember, these people didn't know God. The Persian king sent Ezra back to teach the Jewish people about the God they had taken away from them. Let me tell you, when you're put in slavery, they teach you what they want you to know. How many of you know people that are in slavery? Literally, in their life, they're in slavery. And you know how you can always recognize a slave? by their ignorance. Now I'm just being real. So Ezra's, he arrives 14 years before Nehemiah. You say, well, why did Nehemiah come? Nehemiah was sent by the same king, Artaxerxes. You, you may be wondering, you may be saying, oh, that name sounds a little bit familiar. It should sound familiar to you because Artaxerxes' father married Queen Esther. 
You remember all the Jews were going to be killed by decree? But Esther was here for such a time as this, and she became the queen of Persia. And now the son is sending Jews back to Jerusalem. And the son says, read the word of God to them. And the son says to Nehemiah to go back so you can rebuild the city. This is where this verse comes. The joy of the Lord shall be my strength. You may be in hell right now. You may look like every wall has been broken down. You may be living like a savage inside of what used to be a beautiful city. But I want you to know that God can renew that, that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. How easy is that? Man, when this shout, when this happened, this is what the Lord said. He said, go out of here and eat the fat. Do not mourn. Do not weep. How many of y'all, let's just be honest, some of you thought mourning and weeping was a part of Christianity. That's the part you're good at. Not just the mourning and the weeping, but the griping and the complaining. God put this big load on me. God didn't put no load on you. He said, let me take the load from you. He said, my, my, my shoulders are strong. He said, let me take that burden. Let me take that off of you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, what he said is, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you my spirit. But I want you to recognize this peace is not my peace. This joy is not my joy. This spirit is not my spirit. It's all God's. This faith that I have, it's not my faith. God gave to every one of us a measure of faith. Quit telling me what you can't do. And start getting a little bit of joy for what you can do. Amen. Amen. Because you can do all things through what? Through Christ who strengthens you. Quit complaining to God. Quit cussing out God by telling God you don't have faith. That's a lie. That's a lie from hell. Don't tell me God said he gave to every man a measure of faith. And you tell me, well, I just don't have faith. I just don't believe. Quit cussing God. Amen. I'm sorry, I get excited sometimes. I hate it when people think they don't believe. You do believe. You just got to use the belief you have. You know, I'm born, you're born with all the muscle you'll ever get. You never get more muscle fiber. I'm not getting more muscle. I'm getting bigger muscle. Why? Because I go down and I do something called work. But I want to surprise you here. It's not work. I don't go to the gym and work. I go to the gym and play. And my muscles get bigger and my muscles get stronger. I'm not down there, oh my God, I gotta lift some weights. Oh, I hate this. No, man, I'm in the sandbox with Jesus. He's the one who told me to go down there. Amen. What is it? It's a lifestyle. How many of you know God can become your lifestyle? When He becomes your lifestyle, you'll fall in love with Him. When you fall in love with Him, you'll keep His commandments. When you keep his commandments, all these things become possible. You know, Max Lucado, how many of y'all know who Max Lucado is? Incredible author. Maybe you didn't know Max Lucado got baptized with the Holy Ghost. He's got a book coming out, Help Is Here, talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, he wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit when he wrote a lot of his books, and now he's a Spirit-filled believer, and he says, oh my goodness, help is here. Help has always been here. Help is here. God sent help. How many of you realize God's sending help? What's he going to do? He's going to send his spirit to you. Amen? He's going to do things you can't even mind. All right, let me, let me jump ahead. Pleasing God means living in God's pleasure. How many of you as a Christian would say, well, yeah, I'd just like to live in God's pleasure? That's what pleasing God is. And, and work, if you want to really understand work, work is a part of the curse. How many of y'all know the part of the curse when Adam and Eve sinned was a part of work? But Galatians 3 verse 13 tells me that Jesus became a curse for us to take away the curse. Let me tell you, you don't have to keep serving God in work. You can start playing with God. But you have to understand something. Why? Because slaves are ignorant. Now understand, ignorant is not the same as stupid. All right? I didn't say slaves are stupid. I said slaves are ignorant. What is an ignorant person? An ignorant person is someone that doesn't know something that they could know. All right, this is one of the greatest definitions. I'm going to read this so I don't get it wrong. This came from a book. It came from a year's prayers meetings from Albert Blanks in 1899. All right, this is a great 
metaphor. Listen to this story. A 19th century immigrant, after passing through Ellis Island by way of the Statue of Liberty, was found walking the tracks of the Lehigh Valley Railroad in New Jersey. On his back and in his arms was every human possession he brought with him from the old country. Though fatigued and footsore, he shuffled along the rails until an agent stopped him and warned him to get off the tracks lest he be hit by a train or arrested for trespassing. The man refused. Instead, he produced, produced a railroad ticket from Jersey City to Scranton. The agent looked at him in shock and asked him why he was walking when he could be riding. The immigrant said he thought the ticket gave him only the privilege of walking the rails. He almost danced for joy when he learned that he could ride the train instead of trudging down its tracks. Did you get that? If you're a Beatles fan, I want you to know, we've got a ticket to ride. <laughs> How many of you know, you've got a ticket to ride? And, and if you understand that Beatles song, that Beatles song put that as an invitation to love and play. We've got a ticket to ride. I want you to know, there's some Christians got a ticket to ride, but they're trudging down the train track. And probably complaining while they're doing it. This guy was ready to dance for joy. You're kidding me. You mean this ticket means that not just walk down the track, I can get on the train? Yes, you've got a ticket. You can get on that train. You say, it makes me wonder how the heavenly host must look at us when we've got a ticket to ride and we're walking the train track. How must heaven see us? You know, in Hebrews, it talks about a heavenly host who watches down and sees. Well, what's heaven thinking while, while we're not riding? I want you to realize that, that we are risen people. Do you realize? I'm a risen person, man. I, I've been made to, I've got a free passage to ride. I've got a passage to mount up on the wings of eagles. I've got a passage. I've got a ticket. Jesus bought my ticket. And, and I may fall down, you know. But let me tell you, my DNA says that I'm going to get up. Why? Because I'm a risen person. If you then be raised with Christ, who sits at the right-hand side of the Father, why are you still acting like a fool? I got a ticket. Amen? And Christians are not those that make life work. We are those that make life fun. Y'all didn't, didn't amen. Y'all aren't getting my message. I'm going to probably preach this same thing next week until y'all amen me better. Christians, we're not, those, we're not those people that make life work. How many of you be honest? You know some Christian, you're saying, whatever he has, I don't want any of that. Man, I want people to say, I don't know what that pastor's got, but I want some of that. Because God didn't make me and put me here to work me to death. He put me here to play with me. He put me here to play with God. He gets in the sandbox with me and he plays with me. And he's given me this amazing DNA that causes me to get up every time. Because greater is he that's in me. I didn't say I would never fall. But it's Proverbs 24, 16. But what is in me, because I'm risen, it causes me to rise up every time. Amen? And so work is a curse. I don't have to be a part of a curse. What we need, and I'm going to begin to show you a theology of play, a theology of food. Remember when I preached on food and how food was a part of every celebration? Jesus got into more trouble doing what? Eating than any other thing he did because he ate with prostitutes, he ate with publicans. You know, the first commandment in the Bible was to, to eat freely, and the last commandment in Revelation 22 is to drink freely, and everything in between is a party. Jesus wants to have a good time with you. He didn't put you here to keep you in line. He put you here to keep you in love. Amen? The very first miracle ever Jesus performed was water to wine, and it was at a wedding feast. Do you think they may have had a party there? Jesus said, how about this? He said, you bunch of stuck-up Christians, how about if I just turn water into wine at a wedding feast for my first miracle? 
You're going to tell me Jesus is dull? You're going to tell me Jesus doesn't have fun? My favorite picture, y'all have heard me say this of Jesus. Jesus always looks constipated in every painting you ever see. He looks constipated. Jesus, I love the laughing Jesus. Jesus was the laughing Jesus. That's who Jesus was. And he wants us to become more like children. He said, the greatest among you is going to be like this child. He wants your theology to mature. But how many of us know sometimes as our theology matures, we rely upon our knowledge instead of our relationship. And we brag about our knowledge and not about our relationship. The Bible says that even a wayfaring fool can be saved. Isn't that good? I mean, I'm working on a doctorate degree, but you don't have to have a degree to be a preacher. You don't have to have a degree to be saved. Your relationship is so much more. So the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. The joy of the Lord. God has joy in you. I'm not going to finish all of my sermon, and don't worry, I'm not going to finish it all this Sunday. Because I want you to have fun. Amen. I want you to get to the, the buffet before the crowd gets there. <laughs> and that's okay if I don't finish my sermon. But I'm going to close with this. God placed us here not to judge us, but to enjoy us. That's a good place to close, right? I got two more pages. That's a good place to close. God is not trying to judge you. Religion. I didn't say Jesus. You do realize Jesus was not very religious. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hated him. Religion will always judge you. Jesus didn't come to judge you. He came to take your judgment. And he came to give you his joy, give you his peace, give you his love, give you his faith, give you his life. Don't tell me what you can't do. Let me tell you what you can. I see a lot of Christians who are toiling at creativity who are working at their relationships, who are travailing at faith, who are working to improve lives. Let me tell you, America used to be number one on top of everything. All of these good things, we were number one. Today, America is the most depressed nation in the world. Today, America is the most medicated nation in the world. But we're still number one at something. We're the hardest working people in the world. That's sad. And I'll pick up with this later. You know why we work so hard? Because we're prideful people. And we have made our religion hard work. Well, I'm a hard worker. Yeah? And what did that get you? At the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the poorest nations in the entire world, they're way happier and way more blessed than we are. It's happy to bring a chicken to me. I was like, I don't even know what I'm going to do with the chicken. They was happy to come and take the shirts off of their back, to put the 19 cent big pen in the offering. So happy, so happy. And again, remember, I'm sitting here and I can't speak their language. I don't know what's going on. And I leaned over and I asked the pastor, a missionary friend of mine, Ralph Agamar. I said, hey, Ralph, what are they doing? What, what's going on? I mean, this is taking a long time. What are they doing? And he smiled and he looked back at me and he said, Pastor Rusty, they're receiving your offering. Man, life, they were so happy. How many know the Bible says God loves a hilarious giver? 
But we're not very hilarious when we don't have his life, we don't have his love, we don't have his peace, we don't have his joy. We come to church and we work at it. Work at it. I'll close with this. Like I said, I got so much. Sabbath. Sabbat in Hebrew was the first day of the week, not the last day of the week. You say, well, what difference does that make? Well, it's huge. Because the first day God had with us was about play. God wants to play with you. You see, what we do in America is we work all week so that we can play. God says, I want you to play so that you can work. But recognize work is a curse. Originally, God started with play, and it was play every day. Are y'all getting this? Work is a part of the curse. How many of you believe God can give you a joy about what you do? How many of you believe God can give you a peace about what you do? But Americans, we worship work. And we work at worship. What if church became your PlayStation? You say, what are you doing? Man, I'm going down to church. What are you going to do? I'm going to go play with Jesus. I'm going to play with the pastor. I'm going to play with the praise and worship band. I'm going to play with the people. It would change everything, wouldn't it? What if you didn't walk in these doors and feel judged every time you walk in the door? What about you guys? You know, whenever you miss church, it's kind of hard to come back. Why? Devil. Oh man, I missed. I hadn't been here in two weeks. I hadn't been here in three weeks. If I come back, somebody's going to wonder where I've been. Man, you're making this way too hard. God wants to love you.